In today's video, I'm going to show you how I created a computer network between two Raspberry Pi computers using these ultra-cheap NRF24L01 radios. These radios only cost about a dollar each, and they're normally used for Arduinos where you want to add some wireless flavor to your project. I was able to make them work with all of your favorite networking applications under Linux like SSH, Ping, iPerf, and even streaming audio using VLC. And again, that's all over a $1 radio that's super cheap and readily available. So let's get started. Before I dive into the project, I will give a quick overview of the hardware. These radios are based around the low-cost NRF24L01 chip, which operates on 2.4 GHz. That's the same band that Wi-Fi uses. These devices provide a spy interface for sending data and have an on-air data rate of up to 2 megabit. The basic principle of operation is that these radios can exchange 32-byte packets. That might not sound like much, but you can do this several hundred times per second to achieve higher data rates. To give a comparison to Wi-Fi, the original standard was around 11 megabit, while the latest generation tech can achieve around gigabit, so that makes Wi-Fi 5 to 100 times faster than these low-cost chips. These radios are popular among hobbyists who want to add wireless control to their Arduino-flavored projects. I usually like to push my projects a bit further than the norm and decided to bring full TCP IP computer networking support over these little cheap radios. The hardware is pretty easy to set up. I used short wires to connect the radios to the Raspberry Pis. You can find more details on my blog, which is linked in the description below. The radio attaches to the SPI peripheral that is exposed on the Raspberry Pi GPIO header. For those who don't know, SPI is Serial Peripheral Interface, which is a common chip-to-chip -chip communications protocol for use on boards. The chip select and chip enable lines are also used to signal the chip to be enabled and latch the SPI data registers. It's important that the wires be short to avoid issues with corruption on the SPI data lines. The bus runs at 10 MHz, which is fairly high frequency. I started this project with longer wires and had issues with corruption during extended use. So to pull off this wireless network, I wrote a program called NerfNet that uses these radios to exchange network packets between the two Raspberry Pis. This program has two modes of operation, primary and secondary. The primary and secondary radios perform near identical functions, except that the primary radio is responsible for pulling the secondary radio for packets to exchange. First, I start the secondary side of the system to receive requests from the primary radio. The secondary will be assigned the IP address 192.168.10.2. This can be overridden with a command line flag. Next, I start the primary side of the system. You will see packets start to exchange as soon as the connection is established. The primary will be assigned the IP address 192.168.10.1. So there's two systems here. We have 10.1 and 10.2, and you can ping them back and forth from each respective system. Once the connection has been made, the network can be used immediately. Let's try a quick ping test between the two devices. As you can he see here, there is about 50 milliseconds of latency between the two nodes. Not great, but not bad considering the underlying hardware and the software involved. Let's talk about that software for a second. I am using the TunnelTap API provided by Linux to create a virtual network device. Whenever packets are to be sent over this network, NerfNet intercepts them and sends them over the NRF radio instead. I provided a more in-depth explanation in my blog linked from the description below, but this is a pretty high-level explanation of how this whole thing is working. So let's do something a little bit more exciting than ping and try SSHing into the other Raspberry Pi over this wireless link. As you can see, things are a little slow, but definitely usable. The process of authenticating with the SSH server exchanges some rather large payloads to carry out the validation of the client with the server using public key cryptography. Once logged in, the system is fairly responsive. It starts to show signs of slow link when using larger curses-based applications like HTOP. Speaking of performance, let's use iperf to characterize the link. This will tell us how fast we can transmit data over this network. The result is around 90 kilobaud. I suspect that this could be improved with a better NRF24L01 driver. The one I use seems to require small delays between transmit and receive to avoid locking up. There is also pretty limited error handling, which could also help. Now that we have a good idea for how much data can be transmitted over this link, let's try something a bit more exciting. I originally started this project with the idea of transmitting multimedia, possibly video or audio. Well, now that I understand the effective throughput, I think video is out of the question, but audio should be possible. On the primary radio, let's start VLC configured to stream audio over an RTSP stream. I am going to use the Opus codec, which has tremendous performance at low bit rates. I'm using RTSP because it has lower overhead than the HTTP streams that are more common. Now let's start the client to receive audio data from the server. This is a much simpler command that just contains the IP of the server to stream from. 
One simple thing to note is that I've expanded the buffer to two seconds to compensate for changes in latency due to other use of the network connection. Here's a quick recording of audio quality as played back from my small speaker. The audio quality is not bad. The nice thing about this codec is that it uses a relatively small frame size, which is more efficient to send over these radios. I won't get too far into the implementation of NerfNet in this video, but I did write a blog post detailing the effort if you want to learn more. That's linked down in the description below. At a high level, as I mentioned earlier, we use the TunnelTap API, which is available under Linux to create a virtual network device. This is all done automatically by the NerfNet program that I wrote. The one potentially interesting technical detail of this program is that I decided to use protocol buffers to design the format of the packet to exchange between the Raspberry Pis. This simplifies the process of defining the format of packets by using an interface definition language, or IDL, to define the message. This then generates code to create network packets that can easily be transmitted. I simply add the length of the message to the front of each protocol buffer before it is sent over the radio, and then take care to ensure that none of those encoded packets are more than 32 bytes long. It's really quite simple. The NerfNet binary also has a few command line flags that can be used to test the link through a ping command and allow tuning the performance by adjusting the time between transmit operations. I suspect this flag wouldn't be needed if the driver was a little more stable. For now, there's about a one millisecond delay between transmits to make sure that things don't drop. So that's NerfNet, as I have affectionately called it. Um, if you want to try it out yourself, you definitely can. So I've actually put the code on GitHub and that's linked from the description. I also have a blog post where I talk about some of the hardware and how to connect it all up. And you just need one of these little radios. Actually, you need two of them, but they're a dollar each. I got mine in a 10 pack for $11 from Amazon. So it's not tremendously expensive. And of course you need a couple of Raspberry Pis and some wires, which if you don't already have, I, I encourage you to get them because they're, they're super fun. Um, the code is well documented and explained in the, in the blog post. So if you want to learn about computer networking and protocols, um, it's probably a good resource to check out. Um, I don't make a ton of videos, but if you want to see more from me, feel free to subscribe. I kind of do this maybe every few months, so I'm not going to spam your feed. Um, every like I get really motivates me to do this more, so if you enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a like, and I try and answer comments and the questions as well. I read them all, so feel free to do that. Um, but that's all I've got for now, so I will see you next time.